Hello. Okay, hello. Uh, my name's Ian, this is Marcel. For some reason we're doing this as a duo, um, as if it wasn't hard enough as it is. Um, we're going to do consecutive slides, so the potential for comic error here is pretty big. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is where physical meets digital, and as industrial designers, this is how we see things. <laughs> is digital is sexy and cool and all about now, and the physical world is trying to fit into this new skin and trying to be relevant. Uh, so how is it trying to do that? Well, in our experience, you've got, on one hand, you have the, the, the content that the user wants to, or that the people want to access, and then you have the people themselves. They're trying to access that content through an object, and that's generally what we're involved in. But that, those objects are disappearing, so there's a tend towards kind of things becoming invisible. Televisions are becoming sheets of glass, and mobile phones are becoming sheets of paper. And as an industrial designer, I think you, you're, you have kind of a crisis of conscience or a crisis of identity. And if the things that you're meant to be designing are disappearing, well then, uh, are you going to disappear? <laughs> uh, but um, our point of view is that up until now, people have been engaging with content through the screen. So we think we're almost paying homage to this glowing rectangle. That glowing rectangle can be on your desktop or in your pocket, but we're really only engaging with content in the commercial world through the screen. But that's changing. And the, I suppose we've always had kind of dedicated devices to manipulate the digital world. But what we've got now is anything can be, uh, any kind of object we're using can create, manipulate, and connect data. It's not a new idea. Uh, this is a project from 10 years ago where Robin Southgate dynamically took weather information from the internet and applied it onto toast, which is probably the, the lowest tech object you can find. And uh, another kind of whimsical uh, project is the natural fuse by Usman Haik, whereby uh, the carbon offset of a house plant is used to determine how much electricity should go to uh, a lamp. And the interesting thing about this is that these are connected to a whole network of these plants. And you can share your carbon offset, or you can be selfish and pull all the electricity you want, but you kill somebody else's plant. So these are, these are two very kind of exploratory projects which are happening in the art, uh, art meets technology space. And they're based on an idea called a SPIME. SPIME is a term coined by Bruce Sterling. Um, SPIME is a space-time object. So I'm sure there's people here who are familiar with that. But we're very interested in how that's now moving to the commercial world. So these ideas are actually hitting the market. So uh, MIT, who are leading the way in this, have the Copenhagen wheel, which records data for cycle commuters. But the interesting thing is it's, it's very human data. It's all about the uh, noise pollution and air quality. So it's, it's not the kind of techy gps -y kind of data. Uh, a more recent project, Nokia just collaborated with Burton, the snowboarding giant, to see what kind of information snowboards could develop. So it's building on a project they originally did with skateboards, where they're putting a sensor in underneath the trucks to understand what kind of information is available. Obviously, when, when Burton got involved, the snowboard becomes the input device. So simply by, by riding down a mountain, snowboarders are generating and collecting data about what they're doing. One of the interesting things about this is the way that data is displayed. It's almost game-like. And the, the, the game-like way of engaging people is really interesting. And Nike are doing it now with Nike Grid, where they're, they're addressing uh, urban runners in, in London. And the, the connections with the Matrix is not lost on anyone. It's called Grid and the Matrix. And they use uh, hardline telephones to, to uh, relay their, their position and their times. So last but not least is Nike Plus, released in 2006. I'm sure everybody knows what it is. Um, effectively, it's a talking shoe. It's a shoe which is generating content. So runners are going out on their run, and their shoe is collecting all the information they need. The most interesting thing about this is what's happening after the run, is that users are going online, sharing this content, and competing with their friends in a way which is only facilitated by the fact that the information came from a shoe. If it was more complex than that, this wouldn't happen. This type of, this type of behavior would not happen. So the way we engage with, with digital device at the moment is, is very solitary. You know, we talk about it being personal and socially connected, but in a physical sense, it's a very solitary interaction. So what we think the, the opportunities are is that with uh, the Internet of Things and with the, what we're calling post-digital objects is a term that's out there that is a physical object that has a digital signature that can, that can create and communicate data. With these, we'll be able to build much more engaging experiences. Um, and then to conclude... Uh Everybody should know the idea that, that objects have fundamental properties. So if you remember back to your days in school, mass, density, volume, these were the fundamental properties of objects. But we believe that as designers, we need to consider data as one of those fundamental properties. Um, it creates more engaging project, products, and for us, it's actually exciting. 
Um, it's an exciting time to be an industrial designer. We've talked about a lot of examples during the talk. Uh, if you follow that link, if you know what that is, um, you'll be able to see a list of our full bibliography. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks. Thanks.